but we were on our way in that direction. He, with his speech April the 4th, 1967, was calling for a shift in the struggle and in the movement in the United States. He wanted us to move from simply seeing our need to deal with Jim Crow law and segregation and all of its concomitant features, but he wanted us to understand also that the nation preoccupied with managing the world through wars, Vietnam at that moment, was also a part of the struggle that we in the movement had to contend about. He recognized that justice for black people and poor people and women and children in the United States was linked, absolutely linked, with the behavior of the power structures of the United States who thought they owned the world and must manage the world through our hundreds of military bases around the world and by our superior military forces. And Martin King said, the movement in the United States must shift. And I know this was a shift in his thinking because we talked about it for at least two years before that. When people were clamoring, you must speak out against Vietnam, uh, the, the Vietnam War. We talked in 65, I represented him, him on an international delegation of clergy. He went to Southeast Asia. He could not go, would not go, would not identify himself as that, but he asked me to go in his stead. He already was very much vehemently opposed to the war. He saw its evil. But he knew, I knew, others knew, that as the great spokesperson and intellectual fervor and spiritual and moral guide to the struggle, he could only speak out when the spirit told him to speak out and not when we tried to pressure him into speaking out. So April 4th, 1967, he stood before the Riverside Church in a packed, crowded house, and he declared that a nation that is already spending more for war and military purposes than for the social programs of his nation is already facing bankruptcy and death. He called there for the revolution of values, the revolution of the spirit, and the revolution in which the United States would be transformed into a different entity and a different power. He was secondly struck by the necessity of identifying with the poor. He came to Memphis because he said at one point to me, Jim Lawson, Jim, you're doing in Memphis what I intend to do with the Poor People's Campaign. He came to Memphis not necessarily because he wanted to or not because other people did not want him to. He came because he felt this could be the beginning of the Poor People's Campaign and the identification of the movement not with advancement for black people only but for the lifting of poverty and the ending of structural poverty in the United States. And I, that was the second major thing. And the third thing that was on his mind was making the poor people's movement take wings and fly with power and joy. The question, what do you think our brother Martin would want to say to those of us gathered this gathered this evening in King Chapel at Morehouse College. I think Martin King would say something like this. We must see that our struggle for emancipation, for liberation, our struggle to free this nation of its racism, we must have new insight into the meaning of racism. Racism is the most sexist institution that the United States has ever established. The black church cannot eradicate racism if it does not eradicate its sexism. Oh. <laughs> just, just do some reading of the sexist way in which we treated Indian women and Mexican women and black women. And remind ourselves that in the 2010 Justice Department a report on the violence against women. That report was five women a day are murdered in the United States. 
five women a day are murdered in the United States by boyfriends, ex-husbands, ex-boyfriends, or ex-husbands. Five. And the statistics also demonstrate that every three minutes, a woman, a female, ages 12 to 24, the major category, are raped in the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Racism and sexism go hand in hand. The third element of that racism is violence. It was always a violent institution, whether in 1619 or in 16 or, or in 1780 or in uh, 1840. A violent institution, a violent institution in, in fact, 1910. Also, in the year 2012, it remains a violent spiritual force of wickedness in the United States. We cannot create the new America unless we recognize that racism, sexism, violence, and the structural poverty of too many people in our society go hand in hand. None of them are going to be crashed until we crash them in our own hearts and crash them as a whole. The movement of the future must be a movement that calls all generations and all Americans to the transformation of their own lives so that they see the beauty and truth of life and at the same time know that they must pit their lives against the forces that are obvious in the presidential campaign from the Republican delegates. Yes. Yes. In the words of Nick Greenwich about the President of the United States, unless we link these things and then link them also, link them also to our own transformation and freedom, we will have no movement in the 21st century. If King could speak, he would say, we started the possibilities of emerging nonviolent direct action movement that did shift American life in a manner that most of us do not yet understand. And in the 21st century, if our nation is to be preserved, if our nation is to be saved from itself, there must be a nonviolent revolution that will make our movement of the past sickly in comparison. Nonviolence is one of the places where we ignore Dr. King entirely. He is the symbol that lifted into the middle of Western civilization the notion that nonviolent struggle is a science of social change that can save you and that can save our land and save all our people. It is Gandhi who named it nonviolence. It is not pacifism. <laughs> it is not absolutism, and war is not the chief violence. The chief violence is racism. The chief violence is daring in the United States and the part of some powers that be to say that people ought to work for whatever we pay them and not insist that every man and every woman work has dignity, King said. Every man and every woman wants to work. They have the right to work. It is the power of God in them to contribute to their own humanity and to the well-being of others. So King would insist, no matter who you are or what you are, you have power in your life given of God, power from creation. It's the power that can allow you to insist that you will live your life by some standards and values that make life significant and meaningful. We must continue to work towards the development of a nonviolent struggle in the United States that will change this nation forever and halt the nation in its drift towards tyranny. And a tyranny that will make past tyrannies pale in comparison. King would insist 
It is coexistence. It is the beloved community, or it is non-existence. And I think here at Morehouse on this evening to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. is to say we must lift up again the cudgels of struggle and conflict and capture the meaning of the science of nonviolent methodology and theory and practice. And we must organize campaigns in our country again allow justice to roll by mighty waters and peace to become the hallmark for every boy and every girl and every person in their life. Let me change the pace a little bit and sit here uh, and try to be brief. There's something about getting up to a pulpit that makes us preach. <laughs> so I'll, I'll sit here and, and try very quickly to go through these uh, questions and forgive me. Um, this is 68 and we were mostly uh, good friends. And Dr. King had been very, very depressed since the time of the disruption of the march and his speech on April 3rd. I ended up having to go to the court with Jim and I was of testifying after Jim. So Jim left the court and I was still there. And so when I got back to the Lorraine Motel, um, I'd been gone all day. Now forgive me, but this is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. When I walked in, he said, where have you been, little nigga? <laughs> we still use the N word then as a term of infection amongst ourselves. He used it very seldom. But I said, I've been in court. And he was there with his brother, with Ralph Abernathy, with Bernard Lee, and, and uh, I had not seen uh, A.D. King. So I turned to A.D. and started shaking his hand. And he said, little nigga, I'm talking to you. <laughs> and when I turned around, he took a pillow off the bed and threw it at me. And I said, I'm, I'm, I was just speaking to your brother. He said, you've been gone all day long. Where have you been? you supposed to report to me. Don't you know I need to keep up with what's going on? I said, what is the matter with you? And he said, don't you know you work for me? I, that's something he never would say. And I said, what you been eating? And they've been eating catfish. <laughs> there, there were about 10 extra plates, 10 plates of catfish and all the catfish gone. I said, you all didn't save anything for me to eat. And he said, you still haven't given me a report. And he threw another pill at me. And so, I mean, I'm, I didn't know what to do. So I took the pill and I threw it back at him. And the next thing you know, Ralph picked up a pillar and uh, everybody picked up a pillar and started beating on me. And so it was a, it was a double room you know, a room with two double beds. And by the time they got through beating on me, I was down between the two beds with the pillars piled up. And I had never seen him in all of the years we were together as quite that foolish and playful. And it was, it was so good. Yeah. Uh, because he'd tell jokes, but whenever he told jokes, he'd even tell jokes rather restrained. But he had no inhibitions and he was living with such an abandon that I, I was pleased to see him that way. Mm -hmm. And then there was a knock on the door <coughs> and Reverend Kyle said, you all are supposed to be at dinner. And it was about quarter to six 
And he said, my wife's been cooking all day. If you all don't hurry up and get ready, he said, well, let me go upstairs and put on a clean shirt and tie. And he left. And I, I sat there and said, what was the matter with him? What have you all been doing? You know, and there were no beer bottles or wine bottles or nothing around. And, you know, it was just catfish. I said, you all got high on catfish? And uh, somebody said, it must have been Freedom High. And I felt, you know, I felt really good. Uh, but then James Orange was, was a great big guy. We were all playing, being foolish. So when James knocked on the door and we went out, I started boxing with James. And so we were sort of shadow boxing out there in the, in the parking lot. And Martin came out and I said, you know, it's kind of cool. Well, you better go back and get a coat. You've had a cold. Because the night before, even before that brilliant speech, he'd had a fever. He'd been depressed. He didn't want to come to the meeting. Uh, we went to the meeting and saw the crowd there. It was pouring down rain. And we went back to get him. And uh, so the contrast from the day before to that day was just, you know, phenomenal. But when the shot rang out, um, we had been playing, so I thought it was a firecracker. Our car backfired. And I looked up and didn't see him. And I thought he was clowning again. And then I saw that his shoes had come off of his feet. And his shoes were laying under the, the rail. And his body was, was down. And it was clear from that moment, as soon as I ran up there, uh, that the bullet had hit the tip of his chin and went straight to his spinal cord. And so the picture you see of us pointing was because all of the police started running over here. We said, don't come over here. The shot came from over there. Now, nobody went over there where the shot came from. They all were coming over here to see what happened. And I, I don't know what that means, but after that, we all ended up in the room that uh, he had been in. The downstairs room was his brother's room, but we, we ended up in, in the room that he was living in. And we got together and Jesse had gone on back to Chicago, uh, but uh, James Orange and Bevel and Jose Williams and uh, Bernard Lee and all of us that were left got together and said, look, as Ralph said in his funeral service, they can kill the dreamer, but we'll, we need to make sure that the dream lives on. Now, I get a little frustrated at Morehouse because there seems to be a tendency to diminish the significance of nonviolent social change. And uh, you all go through various kinds of stages of of uh, militancy, of uh, confusion, whatever it is. But um, I want you to look at Harlem. And Harlem was that same way in 1957 when I lived up there. It has not changed at all. Atlanta in 1957, the airport was a Quonset hut with one runway. Right. Yeah. Atlanta is a testament to the implementation, implementation of the gospel and the mission of Martin Luther King. Maynard Jackson decided to get in politics on the day that Martin was killed. And he ran first against uh, Herman Talmadge, but he came right back in 1969 and ran for the president for the city council presidency or vice mayor as we called it then. 
And then I ran for the Congress in 1970, was elected in 1972. We elected Maine as mayor in 1973. And this city started to change. And uh, we were less than a million people then. But now we're almost 5.9 million, pushing the 6 million. And it was because I think what Martin was trying to do in the Poor People's Campaign was to get us to focus on eliminating poverty. Well, you couldn't eliminate poverty without economic growth. And when Martin was killed and Nixon was elected, because people got confused about, uh, about everything. <laughs> um, they changed the rules of the game economically. Yeah, yeah. And it's why I tell people, and to the last question, what would he want us to be doing? All of the things that Jim Lawson said about the world in which we live are symptoms of an dysfunctional global economy right. that almost everywhere in the world there's some people getting very very rich That's right. uh, but the majority of people are getting poorer and poorer mm -hmm. and the gap between rich and poor is wider which is the reason why I said somebody <coughs> needs to be studying some economics All right. because we've got to restructure a global economy finally Martin said I admire the Good Samaritan, but I don't want to be one. I don't want to spend my life picking up people by the side of the road after they've been beaten up and robbed. I want to change the Jericho Road. And I say the difference that he was meaning there was that individual charities, individual missions, individual service is wonderful. But we didn't do that in the Civil Rights Movement. We systematically changed the world. We were in Birmingham, but the whole South changed. We were singing We Shall Overcome Here, but it helped the Berlin Wall come down. And so, and, the, and then Morehouse gave Jimmy Carter an honorary degree in 1976. And I think that the, in the charter, the, the charge that uh, Dr. Gloucester wrote for him, it was very reminiscent of the mission of Martin Luther King. And for those four years that I was in the UN and Jimmy Carter was in the White House, we didn't have any war. We didn't kill anybody. Uh, we made peace in Panama and developed the Panama Canal. And the reason we're having to think about a port in Savannah now is because the widening of the Panama Canal, which grew out of Jimmy Carter's treaty, is creating a new economic opportunity that nobody's ready for. South Africa changed, Zimbabwe changed, Namibia changed. There was peace between Egypt and Israel. Nobody, no Egyptian was killed for 40 years. No Israeli was killed by an Egyptian. It is possible Dr. King's message is not an illusion or a dream. It's a real possibility for serious people who want to get serious about politics and economics on a global as well as on a personal level. And that's what I think our conversation is about. So why don't you come on back and join us, Dr. Harvey. <laughs> First, I thought we were going to take these one things at a time, but I think we ended up, all of us, talking about all three. Yeah. So uh, maybe we can get to the questions and discussion now. Thank you very much, Sister Dorothy, Brother Jim, Brother Andrew. I want all of you who are there to know that there is consciousness of time here. So you don't have to be anxious about that. I want you also to know that there is consciousness as well about how important this conversation is. 
and we're going to have to work our way on this one. What we promised to our class was that those who were here representing the class would have an opportunity to raise questions, I'm trying, to raise questions with the witnesses in any way that they wanted to, and also to make comments growing out of what the witnesses have said to them. So after such a wonderful time of what I saw from the back, patient and attentive listening, I'd like to know what's on your mind, what are you thinking about, what kind of questions do you have in response to what you've heard here from our beloved witnesses. Good evening, everyone. My name is Byron Granberry. I'm a junior here at Morehouse College, studying political science and economics. And in our class, we often talk about the politics of change and this idea of transformation. As uh, we stated earlier, the class focuses on the future of America as well as the last year's market. So looking towards this future and the discussion that was just brought up by Ambassador Young about the differences between the transformation in Atlanta and other cities like Harlem, where do we begin and how do we focus ourselves as a community, as, as a world, to create this change here? Well, the first thing we did in Atlanta that was different than, well, Young fellow came here from Detroit and said, why didn't this happen in Detroit? Detroit was richer than Atlanta. Why, what happened? I said, well, it was, it was sort of an accident. In Detroit, the power was in the hands of the labor unions, and the labor unions and the black community made a coalition, and they got so powerful that they scared business away. In Atlanta, the labor unions were racist. And so the business community came to the Atlanta University Center and we formed a coalition between business and the black community and we brought a labor community along reluctantly. But every candidate from Mayor Hartsfield on to Kasim uh, Reed has been elected by a coalition that is basically the black community and the business community and the labor community working together. So we created a political unity in Birmingham, in New Orleans, and almost everywhere else, including places where there are black mayors. You didn't keep the coalition of business, labor, and and race together, and we did. And uh, Maynard Jackson understood he didn't occupy Wall Street, he brought it to Atlanta. And if you look at our airport, which is probably cost us $15 billion, but no taxpayer has ever paid a penny for it. He financed it through tax-exempt municipal bonds, which pay for themselves and that $15 billion airport generates $31.5 billion a year and employs 60,000 people. Now, Kasim Reed is opening up in May another billion and a half dollar international terminal, which will create somewhere between three and 5,000 more jobs. And it still hasn't cost us anything. We learned to make capitalism work in a democratic and humanitarian way. Uh, how's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Derek Reed. I'm a senior African American studies major from Philadelphia. And uh, I want to uh, bring my question back to uh, King in particular. Uh, I'm sorry, I want to bring the question back to Martin Luther King's life. I know elder sister Dorothy Cotton, you talked about uh, that everybody sort of wanted Martin Luther King to be a part of what they were doing. So my question is, 
Do you believe, did Martin have a sense or did he have a uh, idea that the movement was becoming too focused on him? And if, if any of you had this concern and whether or not you believe that it had, it could jeopardize the steam on the progress of the movement long term. My sense is, I don't think he worried about it being focused on him, and yet it was because he emerged as such a powerful leader and brought this wonderful tool called nonviolence, and everybody could participate if that's the if that's the tool, if that's the spirit with which we were working. People heard his voice since the the Montgomery bus boycott. People paid attention to that, and though we need some of that kind of teaching and preaching and and, and to learn what they did there. But as you heard earlier in the introduction of all of us, the zeitgeist was a plum de land. Uh, people were beginning to protest all over the place where we had not been. People were just doing stuff. Esau Jenkins on uh, Johns Island drove an old school bus back and forth between Johns Island off the coast of Charleston, back taking people, people back and forth to work. But he decided that when a white man shot a black young guy, that uh, the reason people didn't rise up in righteous indignation was because they didn't have any political power. Dr. King didn't have anything to do with that, but he saw Jenkins start teaching people, even on the bus, that they must have political power. He started something. You need to fast forward. I could say a lot, but I, there's no time for that, about how that action, uh, we ended up inheriting a program called Citizenship Education and, and helping African-American folks and, and mostly older people for the Citizenship Education Program helping them understand what, why it was important to have political power. And the people were starting to, uh, for, for whatever, some wonderful poetic and spiritual reasons, were starting to struggle against what I call the American style of apartheid system. It was just happening. The spirit was moving all over the land. I think too many, I'll say it this way as gently as I can, I think too many black scholars, uh, too many academicians who are perusing the movement with limited resources and limited effort to do a comprehensive look at things because it was a massive movement and King's work was contribution of extraordinary. They spend too much time trying to um, do what? Uh, cut Martin King Jr. down to size instead of using Martin King as maybe a gift of history that if we understand well what who he was, what he said, what he did, and the movement, we would get ways of our proceeding through this quagmire of the 21st century. It is I do not like the cult, the religion, the ideology of celebrating people who become famous or popular or wealthy or powerful. I think it's a bad religion, a poor religion. But it is true across the history of humankind that when human beings come together and work hard together, some people will always excel. In every football team in the National Football League, there are a handful of people who are seen as the leaders of that team on defense and offense. They rise to the challenge through their talent, through their very hard work, and through their willing to take the risk on behalf of the team. And I do not think we're gonna ever find a time where we can have a movement like the Occupy people are trying to do, where all the people are leaders. All the people can participate in their own transformation and emancipation. But at the same time, our equality is not rooted in our sameness. And so I think a lot of papers and whatnot about King that wants to trick his character or his talent or his leadership is nonsense. And I think it's hurting the intellectual community 
because then the intellectual community is divorcing itself from its responsibility to provide strength and courage and feet in the continuing struggle for beauty and justice. <clears throat> Joshua Etienne from Miami, Florida. I'd like to address my question, uh, Reverend James Lawson, or Jim Lawson, as he gave us the opportunity to call him. Um, I wholeheartedly believe that King Spirit is somewhere with us today in the chapel, if he's anywhere at all today. And if energy is never lost or destroyed, and it's merely transferred, and this energy is being transferred to the young people, the new generation, where do you think the fight moves to? Where do you think his spirit is leading us to? His energy, the same energy that you guys had during the movement, where is that leading us to? What is the new fight? Well, I, I, I think I tried to say that one of the key things that King contributed, and incident, incidentally, Gandhi, in 1935, told Howard Thurman, a graduate of Howard University, but a teacher here at Morehouse at one time, that, it might, that he, in his development of nonviolent understanding, was, had not been able to do much for the rest of the world, but that perhaps the Negro in America would be the one that would help spread the notion of nonviolent science or struggle. Now, I, I think that's the cutting edge for the future, for the generation of this time. But let, let, let me say too on this that uh, whether we like it or not, whether the world likes it or not, we have got to learn to get Africans, Chinese, Arabs, and white folks together. Mm -hmm. There's only one person who in his own DNA yes. contains all mm -hmm. of those cultures. And that happens to be Barack Obama. All right. yeah. now, I'm, not, I'm not a, I mean, I'm not a fan particularly. I mean, I supported Hillary Clinton, mainly because I knew that this world was so vicious and bitter, I was afraid that they would destroy him like they did Martin. And I thought that okay. if Hillary had it for, in fact, I said, I want to support him for president in 2016. Because by, well, I was looking at myself, I would not have been able to do necessarily what Maynard did. Mm. But Maynard having given his life for eight years to fight all the battles, I came in and cleaned up. And I took it to, I mean, I couldn't have done that if I had been first. Mm. And I saw him as being a backup. So, and history didn't have it that way. They put him first. Yeah. And they have tried in every possible way to destroy him. And he has succeeded and overcome. Now, it's going to get more rough in the next eight months. And there is nothing else that we can do. If we lose this election and lose the Senate, find some place to go. It's gonna be hell here. And I, I don't, I mean, I'm, that just happens to be the way our politics is structured. Now, hmm. the other thing is that if he's not elected and you have an isolationist, who reaches out to us. And Romney may not be all that bad, but Romney is not going to be able to deal with China. Romney is not going to be able to deal with the Arab world. First place, he's scared of him and he's dumb. So he's, ne he's never been there. 
I mean, Barack Obama has an African father. All right. See, he has a white mother who was a saint. See, she then, after his father dumped her, she went to Indonesia and married a China, All right. a Chinese Indonesian. So he's got two Chinese half sisters. All right. See. But his Chinese stepfather was a weak man. And his mother said, don't pay any attention to him. Remember your father as a genius and a man of integrity. See? Then he goes to uh, Hawaii, California, New York, to Columbia, to Harvard, back to Chicago, and then back to, to Harvard, and back to Chicago again. There's no president in the history of the United States that has had that much all-American education. Mm -hmm. The only thing he doesn't have, and that's the reason I've been reluctant, he never came south. So he doesn't know what we're talking about, really. He's British. But he had, he, he, until this, I think for me, the, the major thing that came out of the uh, Trayvon Martin was Obama had to say, damn. <laughs> that boy looks like he could be my son. <laughs> and, and to me, that, that was a, a, a wake up moment for him. So that that uh, it's not changed as much as he'd like to, and he has to believe it. If he had gone through what we'd gone through, uh, he couldn't be as cool and rational as he had. Yeah. I mean, so the Lord, the Lord protected him from something. Uh, protected him for a purpose. Uh, and um, he is cool beyond cool. No matter what they say, he reflects it and deflects it very nicely. He's really very loving and nonviolent. See? But people want to say that that's weak. But that's smart. Right. That's the only way to lead a very screwed up world. I'm still respons <clears throat> responsible for watching the time, but I'm also responsible for making sure that we get the best sampling that we can get of some of the things that are wanting to come out. So, Sister Anne Marie, why don't you go ahead? You got the mic. Good evening. Anne Marie Mingo, a PhD student at Emory University and teaching here at Morehouse. Um, my question really starts from where we started at the beginning of this evening. As I listened to Sister Sanchez talk, she talked about a God consciousness activism. And then, Sister Cotton, you talked about the beloved community and this, this idea that there was a spiritual force that was moving across. And Reverend Lawson, you talked about this need for a spiritual power. And then Ambassador Young, you talked about this need for the spiritual power to basically transform the Jericho Road. As we think about uh, the new zeitgeist that's moving around through the Occupy movement, through the Trayvon Martin uh, rallies that are coming together, what's the role of God today? What's the role of the church and religion today in helping to guide and shape social justice movements as we now see them? Yeah, I think in terms of, uh, of uh, spiritual energizing force and, and, and quality that with which we all need to be infused, that spiritual force, that a spiritual, a spirituality, I've, I've gotten really a, bit, a, a lot turned off with folks who argue religion, and uh, if you don't believe uh, that God is, if you don't define God uh, the way they define God, I mean, there's no dialogue. So I, I just moved to another place in terms of opening myself to that great uh, spirit. Even, I understand that Jesus said God is spirit, and if you take that seriously, we've got to look at your, what is spirit, and what does it mean to be infused with that spirit. I don't, I can't relate to the labels anymore when people say, I am a Christian, I am a Buddhist, I am a, unless I feel and see that spirit manifest in them, then I can relate to them. Okay. To me, yeah. And I've heard preachers from the pulpit 
uh, you're pre-taught to uh, congregations in a way that if you don't believe what this person says at the pulpit, and like the, all the women, in my niece went to a church, and if you don't, uh, women should not wear pants, even in this day and time. So the women, my niece, you cut up all your slacks and make a skirt, because this preacher said that's not what, you, you're not supposed to do that. Anyway, we, there are a lot of examples. But the people who need to listen to somebody tell them, I think, uh, maybe need to have some sessions where they focus on merely what is spirit, what are those values that flow from that spirit, which has been defined as God and their, their other, other names for it, capital I, as well. I don't need to go on with this, but I'm, I'm really concerned that we understand spirit and we open ourselves to wonderful spirit. Now, the, the spirit was moving, we sang a song, the spirit is moving all over this land, and, uh, you know, and it was. So, something I want to, to say about leadership, because I get, especially on campuses, uh, students who are almost asking, where are the other leaders coming from? It seems to be so difficult, and I wish you all would speak to that. It's difficult for people of your generation, and a lot of places where I spend some time, to think, to understand that leaders were uh, folks who saw something wrong and decided that they were going to start to put some energy into working on, you know, uh, Stanley Lou Hamer didn't shoot out there in Rubin, Mississippi. I think she was in the eighth grade, and did you know? Uh, oh. Yeah, so if, thinking about where leaders come from, I'd like to know what your thoughts are in terms of leadership for now. Well, we must remember, it seems to me, that the movement of the 60s, especially the emerging nonviolent direct action movement that King and Rosa Parks symbolized, was another form of the exodus in the book of Exodus, or the emancipation of people from slavery to a new understanding of God and to the new understanding of their own lives. I will say to you very quickly that the King movement of which I was a great a part and that I recognize as a primary shaping thing of my own life was a judgment upon religion and the churches and Christianity. They must also be transformed. All of them. Especially, especially, especially Christianity. Especially the church. It must be transformed from an agency that identifies itself with some of the worst features of the cultures where they are imbibed to become a to become a, a religion that becomes more reflection reflective of Jesus, who is a nonviolent practitioner and minister. Yeah, but can you do you have a thought about leadership and what it is and where it comes from? I'd love to hear you. If, if anybody has any thoughts about leadership for, for these times, do you Hello. see yourself as a leader? Hello, everyone. Uh, right now, I do not see myself as a leader. Right now, I see myself as a student uh, because before you, you can lead, you must be able to learn to follow and have a real understanding and focus. Uh, but I think in our generation, uh, there's a leadership issue because we're not as aware or upset by the evils in the world. We, we accepted what we see as wrong. And I'm getting to the point where I'm fed up. And as a preacher said, according, uh, referring to the Trayvon situation, and uh, enough is enough. And uh, you, when you see a problem, and you feel that you have the skills and you develop the skills, you can focus and delineate the situation and solve it. That's what leadership is. And I, I think our generation is getting to that point. Well, you have to remember the Jim Lawson, and I think the most powerful movement and the greatest support for SCLC, uh, other than Martin Luther King himself, came from the Nashville Sit-In Movement. They, and as students, they were getting up at six o'clock in the morning meeting with, with Jim Lawson. How many days a week did you all meet? Oh, uh, in the first four months, just one day a week but it was at six o'clock in the morning. And so the people who came together to discuss and talk about nonviolence were serious. And when the sit-ins came, they were ready. When the Freedom Rides came, they had already had the foundation and they led Martin Luther King. 
See, Martin Luther King was led by Rosa Parks. See, he was led by this Nashville sit-in movement. He was led by the Freedom Ride. He was led by Fred Shuttlesworth mm. in Birmingham. We never would have gone, we never would have sat in a meeting in Atlanta and decided we were going to Birmingham. Uh, we wouldn't have gone to Selma if he, Amelia Boynton had not come to, to Atlanta and asked us, please come help us. The, and so the, it, it, was not, it was never a top-down movement. It was always a grassroots movement that came to us for help. And we were able to respond. Leadership, Lee, you, you thinking about that? Oh. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Amar Chief, senior philosophy major. <clears throat> I see, I, I, I definitely see myself and uh, all of my classmates as potential leaders um, in the sense that everyone has eyes to be able to see and call out. Everyone uh, has eyes to be able to see and call out injustice and be able to act upon that. Uh, I guess my, my question about leadership, a question I've been wanting to ask you all, is um, as someone born in the 90s and looking back on this generation, I find that oftentimes <clears throat> we are waiting for leaders, right? And you are waiting for we have, leaders. I find that our generation seems to be waiting for leaders. And we talked about the promised land and when we get there. And I wanted to ask the question about how we, uh, well, first of all, how you all felt about the heralding of Barack Obama being elected as president as us having achieved some of Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream um, and how that may have affected I guess the masses, as far as leadership goes, are spelling as though there's no other work for us to do because we we've accomplished something. No. So I was bullshit. achieve something. We didn't achieve a whole lot. Mm. Bar Barack Obama was selected by some Jews in Chicago yeah. and was put up <laughs> to, to take the blame. Now this is this is the scheme. <laughs> he was put up to take the blame for 20 years of Republican true right. He was supposed to fail. He was set up to fail. And we rallied around and he succeeded. So in spite of the plan. Now in, after he got to be president, you had people like Larry Summers of, of Harvard and Rahm Emanuel that did everything they could to, to make him ineffective. And I think Michelle ran them out. Okay? And because when they were putting together that economic plan, there were three women as economic advisors. Larry Summers and Rahm Emanuel would not even let the women's papers get before the president. There's a book by Ron Suskin, Confidence Men. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they manipulated Barack Obama for two years. And in spite of that, he fought through all of that and has still succeeded. He still got a health bill plan, which Ted Kennedy couldn't get through, the U United Auto Workers, Jimmy Carter, nobody. John Kennedy, uh, Clinton, he got it through, see, and it's a good bill, see. I got a, 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 a Medicare card in my pocket, and basically what it says is, you young people get the same kind of good health care I get. I'm old for old folks get good health care in America, because they whip out that little card and $75 pills all of a sudden cost us $4. So you don't get that. And now, if this bill passes, students will get the benefit of that senior citizen who we've been getting. And yet they call it Obamacare and they like to make it real and something bad. But we are, that's what we've been working for. If you look at, I mean, I don't like Afghanistan, I don't like Iraq, but I thank God we haven't bombed Iran. If there had been Republicans in there, we probably would have had Iran and, and and then we, we got Armageddon almost, because they crazy folks. And they will shoot whatever atomic bombs they got. And all that, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not, they don't have to bomb Washington. 
All they have to do is lob a, 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 a missile into the Saudi Arabian oil fields. Gasoline then becomes $10 a gallon. We have a global recession. And it takes us about the whole, your whole lifetime to recover. Friends, you all have been <clears throat> asking some very important questions. I want to remind you that one of the major responsibilities that we have is not to feel that other people are going to answer our questions mm. for us. Mm. Mm. That you have to struggle with these questions as a part of making yourself the people that we need you to be. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage you to keep asking the questions, to keep looking for the kind of directions that will help us to go to a new kind of America, what I would say, help us to go in the direction that King was trying to take us. Be sure not to Simplify King, mm. not the Sunday school King, yes. but to be deep with him and wrestle with him and see how far he'll take us. I want to thank the witnesses and I also to remind those of us out in the gathering of the community here that this was not meant to be simply an audience uh, kind of event. We are not going to have time at this point to bring some of your questions from out there into here. But we will have an opportunity before the evening ends for you all to enter into this process. One of the things that we want to close out with is a remembrance of what this event was about. We said that this was a program of remembrance and recommitment. That we're looking at King not just for interesting intellectual ideas, but we're looking at King because he is still challenging us and pushing us. And we have to decide how we're going to deal with that. One of our beautiful, <coughs> helpful sisters, Reverend Kim Jackson, and her spouse were kind enough to work on a, a litany that we can all participate in before we leave this evening. And for us to be able to use it best, the lights need to be turned up at this point so that folks can see the litany. Who is in charge of the light turn? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Look at the litany that was given out at the same time that the program was given out. Look at it as something that we can share together. And 
what we're going to do with this is ask us all to stand. And as we use this with me, we're going to ask the witnesses and me to take the role of the leader in this reading. We're going to ask you to take the role of the people responding. And we're going to ask all of us to take it as seriously as we possibly can. We have come together to remember that fateful day when our brother Martin, through a violent act of conspiracy and hate, became our ancestor. We remember his teachings, we honor his legacy. Throughout his life and on the eve of his death, Brother Martin challenged us to address the problems of the poor. He urged us to use our voices, bodies, and the economic resources to ensure the well-being of our neighbors. We remember his teachings, we honor his legacy. As we remember Brother Martin, we acknowledge that he never stood alone. He stood and worked among a great company of freedom fighters, nonviolent practitioners, race women and men, prophets of the people, activists, organizers, educators, agitators, friends, and companions of every human community and creed. We remember their witness, we honor their lives. Despite the great witness of those who came before us, we confess that at times we are distracted and <clears throat> fail to continue the good work begun by our ancestors and modeled by our elders. Tempted by our distractions, we turn away. Walking in forgetfulness, we went astray. We fail to heed Brother Martin's warning against the triple evils of racism, materialism, and militarism. Most often, our nearsightedness causes us to be more harmful than helpful. Tempted by distractions, we turned away. Walking in forgetfulness, we went astray. In our haste to accrue status, we compromise our moral compasses. We value racism over righteousness, sexism over solidarity, classism over community, and American exceptionalism over Brother Martin's vision of the world house of peace. Tempted by distractions, we turned away. Walking in forgetfulness, we went astray. During our times of abundance, we overindulge ourselves. During our times of hardship, we become hoarders of our private resources. We have closed our hands to one another, choosing greed instead of generosity. Tempted by distractions, we turn away. away. Walking in forgetfulness, we went astray. Late one night, Brother Martin heard the voice of God calling him to stand up for righteousness and to stand up for justice. Guided by the light, we too hear the Creator's loving call. We will stand up for righteousness. We will stand up for justice. We commit to disrupting the school-to-prison pipelines that criminalize and enslave our youth. We decry the use of vigilante violence, the newest expression of lynching in our land, 
for its distortion of difference and devaluing of human life. We will stand up for righteousness. We will stand up for justice. We will work for peace. We commit to amplifying the call for economic justice and workers' rights, to work free of intimidation and manipulation, whether we occupy the 1% or the 99%, we will employ our voices and our votes for the well-being of the 100%. We will stand up for righteousness. We will stand up for justice. We will work for peace. We commit to using nonviolent methods to transform conflict in our communities and across the world. We reject fear-based policies and propaganda that compel us to take up arms against our neighbor instead of being reconciled to them as friends. We will stand up for righteousness. We will stand up for justice. We will work for peace. As we stand here surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses who came before us, that we might know the way we stand up for righteousness, we stand up for justice, and we stand up for peace, trusting that the spirit will never, no, never leave us alone. Amen. 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 So be it. Please be seated. Is the Moore House yep, Quartet you. here? Yep. <clears throat> My brothers, forgive an elder for putting you out of order. <laughs> and thank you for being here to share with us. This is not a performance, and we think that we shouldn't have a gathering dealing with King and with commitment if we don't do some singing too. So we've asked some wonderful folks from a place called Spirit House, which is a very important new institution here in Atlanta. And these folks are going to lead us 
in some of the singing that we can do together after our time of litany. These sisters and brothers are part of the Congregational Singing Project of Spirit House. I'm so glad that you're making your way here one way or another. And what they've come to do is to lead us in singing a song that I think you will enjoy and appreciate. The words to the song are at the beginning on the inside of the program. We are building up a new world. The music to that song is the same music as We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. Our congregational singers are going to open the way and they are going to be absolutely certain that you're not going to be just sitting there looking at them, <laughs> but that you will share in the wonderful process with them. My sister and brother singers, would you move from there?
Is Sister Vicki Crawford here? Yes. Good. Good evening, friends. Where do we go from here? It is a challenging and perplexing question, but we have been given an excellent roadmap, and we've had the great privilege this evening to bear witness to some of the most significant transformative leaders for social change of the 20th century. Dr. Vincent Harding, Ambassador Andrew Young, Ms. Dorothy Cotton, and Reverend James Lawson. And I want to thank you, Dr. Harding, for help letting us share in this experience tonight and for your vision in creating the class. Sorry about that. Class. All of you have provided wonderful guidance in your thought and action. And you suggest very powerful ways that we might study seriously and tackle seriously the triple evils of racism, militarism, and materialism and other structures of oppression and domination. But by necessity, as we've heard tonight, and as we know and as we talked about it throughout the semester, we are now challenged to chart a new and different course. And it will need to be creative, inventive, and imaginative. It certainly should be informed by history, but it will also need to capture the nuances and particular concerns of present day issues. So where do we go? We go into the classrooms in our nation's schools and colleges where we study and learn about Dr. King and the freedom movement. We go to study nonviolence and its many possibilities for conflict resolution in our times. We go to do what we are doing tonight, and that is witnessing and learning from the power of story. It's one thing to read about major events in history in class, but it's yet another thing to hear from the personal human narratives and from the people who actually lived through this history. There's something about this experience that really sinks very deeply into our heads and into our hearts. We go into our communities where we work to, we work collectively and strategically to organize around a number of issues simultaneously. We go to work for educational access and equity, for example, and to advocate for peace and mutual understanding. We, work, we go to ensure that our communities are safe and they are strong and they are sustainable. And finally, we go into the world. We go where we build bridges that transcend the differences that continue to divide us, the differences of race and class and gender and sexual identification and religion. We go to advance and strengthen human rights of every kind. So as we remember and we recommit this evening, we should carry the words of Dr. King with us. And, and this is from his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? He stated, our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and to go out into a sometimes hostile world declaring opposition to racism, militarism, and materialism. This calls for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation and that is, in reality, a call for an all-embracing and unconditional love for all people. We remember his teachings. We honor his legacy. I want to close our time together with thanks. Thanks to the ancestors who have been present with us without any doubt. Thanks to all of you who have been present in a very special way. I'd like to ask some of you to give special acknowledgement to some others of you. 
And here's what I'm talking about. I'd like to suggest that first of all, we give some wonderful, wonderful applause to the witnesses who came to be. Another member of the teaching 